Welcome to the Value of Ice. Uh, this is a side event in the Cryosphere Pavilion at the COP25. Uh, my name is Joe Robertson. I'm the Global Strategy Director for Citizens Climate Education. And I'm going to give a brief uh, sort of summary of why we're here to have this conversation about the value of ice. The COP25 has to set up a successful process of upgrading nationally determined contributions uh, to the global climate response. The Chilean presidency of the COP25 has asked that all nations integrate the science of the 1.5 degree target, the uh, terrestrial ecosystems and land use, and the ocean and cryosphere into their nationally determined contributions. And a lot of ministries the way we invest in the future. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the science. We're going to talk a little bit about the way that the science indicates what might happen to things we care about. And from there, we're going to talk about how we can invest for the future and how policy can be upgraded sooner rather than later in the next year in time for the COP26 so that every country in the world has some chance of considering how to protect the world's uh, glaciers and ice caps make sure we have the kind of climate that we're accustomed to um, that has helped to shape human civilization. So um, in order to dive into the science I'm going to introduce um, Isati Sintron um, who's going to tell us about her research and how it connects to some of the engagement work that she's been doing. Isati? Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Um, trying to find my presentation. There you go. Um, so I am a researcher. I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University. And I do um, civic engagement work with um, citizens. <laughs> I'm a little bit short. So um, with citizens climate education. Um, today, I'm going to be concentrating in talking about dark impurities. And that's um, talking about the cryosphere impacts and ambition. Um, so let's take a step back and think about the cryosphere and us. Because sometimes, as Joe was saying, the cryosphere, especially for me, like I come from Puerto Rico, and it feels like a lot of people ask me, what is a tropical girl doing like studying glaciers? I'm like, well, there's a lot of connections. <laughs> um, but that doesn't um, only mean like tropical islands, it's just the whole world. So ice caps are key in regulating air, air's temperature and keeping us cool. Um, and the cryosphere, um, just like our, as a reminder, as a refresher, is ice caps, snow cover, sea ice, and glaciers. Um, and some of this seems like part of the system that is like weather and how our temperature is going, but actually it has like human impacts on the changes of the cryosphere, especially because 75% of the fresh water is stored in the glaciers. And when we talk about people, it seems like so remote areas, but actually, four million people live in the Arctic permanently. And 10% of that are indigenous communities that the whole, their whole livelihoods depend on the fluctuations between the ice and when they can go fishing when, and hunting. Um, so these are very big changes for these communities. Um, so other millions around the world, um, especially those people that live in high mountains, depend on glacier meltwater for drinking water. 
And the melting of glaciers will mean double trouble for water supplies because um, whenever like the melting occurs faster, they are not accustomed to that and that has repercussion on agriculture. And moreover, like when you have um, the glaciers, sometimes they, ha they make some sort of lakes at the end of the glacier when they are melting. And this lakes in the moraine, um, which is like a barrier, um, can break and create like incredible catastrophic floods for these communities. So um, why this matters? Like 10% of the land area of the earth is covered in glaciers or ice sheets. And reports have said that even if we limit our warming to two degrees Celsius, we're going to lose between 15 to 55% uh, of our glaciers, not including any of the ice caps. And human communities in coastal connections, um, in close connection with um, coastal environments, in, including small islands like my own, um, polar islands, Polar areas, high mountains, are particularly exposed to ocean and cryosphere changes, such as sea level rise, extreme sea level, and shrinking of cryosphere. So it, those changes that occur far, far away will have deep impacts on our communities. Um, so I'm going to play a small clip from, this is like James Balog, um documentary on Chasing Ice, and I'm just gonna play like a short part of it because this is my study site. Um, and this is observing the glaciers I saw him are um, over four years. So I'm gonna just play that and let you watch that for a bit. Now we, now we turn on our time happening here as the heat takes away the surface of the glacier and the surface drops. At the same time, the stream is undercutting it from a glacier that's melting faster up valley, washing this thing away. The vast majority of glaciers in the world are retreating. So, when you look at this glacier, you don't see the typical picture of the glaciers that you see in Greenland or Antarctica, because this one looks pretty black. Um, so that's what I study. I study the deposition of light absorbing impurities over, uh, oh, sorry, I don't want to play that again for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay, there we go. So I study light absorbing particles and these particles um, are transported from other areas and deposited on top of the glacier. So if you think about um, when you go out on a very warm day and you're dressed black, um, of course you feel more heat. So that's essentially what these particles do. Um, so since the snow is white, it reflects a lot of um, incoming radiation or solar light and Anything that is not white, any other color, will decrease the albedo, which is the reflection, on the glaciers. So I study black carbon, brown carbon, and dust, and they have potential reduction of 0.4 to 1% albedo reduction, which doesn't sound like much, but it has detrimental um, feedbacks in the melting of the glaciers. So the extent of the impact is not well studied, most of it because of the remote areas. And so these are typically studied in between campaigns um, and different kind of um, other studies that are using models. Um, but every type of um, research that I, 
that are done like field measurements is very valuable into increasing our understanding of the extent of their role in the melting. And part of the importance of black carbon, which is why why I'm like most concerned is because one ton of black carbon equals 600 times one ton of global warming by CO2 over a period of 100 years. Um, so it is regarded as the second most important human produced um, climate agent. So we need to study like, um, where is it coming and how can we reduce it? So primary sources of black carbon include industrial coal, brick kilns, um, open burning agriculture fields, wildfires, diesel engines, resident biofuel cooking and heating, resident coal, coal cooking and heating. And here we see like a distribution of um, the, sorry, I shouldn't, turn around um, <laughs> uh, of a distribution of atmospheric black carbon and you can see like it's like around uh, a lot of the mid latitudes and you get those get transported to the polar regions and the high lati like the high um, mount like mountain like high mountain um, glaciers and each of these regions will have different sources well we see Africa will have a lot of um, biofuel residential cooking and then um, on the northern part we will have more of the diesel diesel engines and like um, biofuel heating um, so this is a picture of my site and um, in, in Iceland, and I have uh, like three glaciers in Iceland that I look at. Um, this is Vatnajökull, um, and in Iceland, 11% of the landscape are made of glaciers, 85% of their electricity comes from hydropower, and the tourism comprise 10% of their GDP. So monitoring what is happening with the glacier is really important to them. So when I go to the field, I normally go with like mountain guides, which are really nice and they <laughs> keep me safe. Um, so we dress up in our bunny suit. That's how they say that we look like. Um, <laughs> and I collect like surface snow and then I take it home, which everyone in the airport looks at me like, what are you doing? Um, and then I analyze it for chemical composition. And so these are kind of the mass concentrations that is more important for me than it is for the public. Um, so I need to know what are the mass concentration, but what's really important are the, um, we use models to try to find out what are the reductions. Um, so what we do is like we model every single parameter um, as if the snow was white, uh, as, it, as if it was uh, no impurities. And then we include the concentrations that we get. And this is um, what we technically see. And what brings, what can bridge that to mitigation and raising ambition is trying to find where this is coming. So I use back trajectories to see what are the sources of that day? So I technically try to find out um, which day. Um, so I collect fresh snow. So the snow was deposited, and then like I just trace back what were the weather events related to that. And I trace back where the air masses are coming from. And so here we see that for that particular day, which was spring 2018, we see that most of it is coming from um, North America or local sources. And the local sources there, I will have to say that a lot of the black in Iceland, it's also dust because Iceland is the primary dust producer of the Arctic and the Iceland dust is black. So I thought like when I saw the pictures before I got into um, studying, I thought it was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of black carbon. Um, but no, it's like a combination between dust and black carbon. And yeah, that's just same. So 
We found concentrations between 10 to 97 nanograms per gram of snow, and this is like well distributed across the land and are consistent with other measurements that have been done here. And when we do the comparisons on what are the contributions, it seemed like black carbon is contributing the most to the albedo reductions. And see, we saw that 30% of the back trajectories throughout the whole campaign um, pass through Northern Europe and 60% come from local areas, including North America, and 10% uh, of the tracks originate from the ocean. Um, it's important to know that shipping uh, and transporting is also like a huge um, source of black carbon. And what I would like for us to take home is that steadily eliminating present day emissions of black carbon globally over the next 50 years will have approximately an equivalent climate mitigation effect of removing 25 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere over the same period. So we are looking at the low hanging fruit of climate because black carbon, because if aerosol is like solid particles, these are um, short and live pollutants. So it means that they have, uh, they, they live in the atmosphere from seven to 10 days. So if we would today say like, we're not emitting more black carbon, which is a total simplistic way to put it. But if we would, then we will get rid of the black carbon that's been transported within like two weeks, for example, or two weeks to a month. So I think it's like a huge opportunity into engage into other mitigation and race ambition. So with that, I'll leave you and I think we are gonna just take questions at the end. <laughs> okay, so are you, is it Heidi? Yes. Coming now, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Izatis. That was a very interesting presentation. And it is true that uh, removing black carbon from the atmosphere has great potential. And, and we tend to forget this. So that was very insightful, thank you. Um, so I would like to tell you about some dynamics of glaciers um, that are not very well known today. So these are the glaciers I've been studying very, very much in the Arctic. And the science on these glaciers is not very much pinned down. But these glaciers have the potential to increase the consequences of glaciers reacting to climate change even more when it comes to increasing sea level rise, increasing the hazards coming from these glaciers. So I would like to tell you more about what they are and what we do understand about these glaciers. So these glaciers, they're called surging glaciers. And the surge means that these glaciers have a particular dynamic, a particular behavior compared to more normal glaciers. So first of all, what are normal glaciers? Why, what do we consider to be normal in our science? So normal glaciers are the glaciers you can see on the left here. So this is a time lapse, just like the very nice time lapse we saw from chasing ice. So glaciers in the world tend to move at different speeds, but they all move. Some move fast, some move very, very slowly. But normal glaciers tend to maintain their behavior for very long time periods. So they behave more or less constantly. But when it comes to surging glaciers, they are a lot more erratic. They behave very, very differently from that of normal glaciers. So on the right, I'm gonna show you a time lapse of a glacier surging in Svalbard. So you will very, very quickly understand what surging glaciers are by looking at the time lapse. What happens with surging glaciers, instead of behaving the same way for very long periods of time, surging glaciers can switch from barely moving to moving extremely rapidly over short periods of time from a few months to a few years. So the glacier we see on the right is moving at 16 meters per day, so 45 feet per day. 
And the glacier is about 30 kilometers long. So this is quite a big baby for Svalbard. And so what we call the surge is exactly that acceleration, the fact that the glacier is changing behavior and the glacier is simply accelerating very, very much. As you can see, it is an extremely dramatic behavior. When glaciers surge, they bulldoze everything on their way. There's nothing stopping them. Um, fortunately, this is in Svalbard, so there are not many people around. But imagine if there were infrastructures, if there were roads, if there were dams, if there were rivers around these glaciers. Um, it will really change the dynamics of these glaciers. So I started by saying that we still do not understand these glaciers very well. And this is still the case today, even though we're many, many of us um, studying these glaciers. So why actually do we still know so little about these glaciers in 2019? Well, it's very simple. When these glaciers start to surge, when they start to accelerate, it is impossible <laughs> to have any of our instruments surviving in these glaciers. So let's take a look at some of these glaciers surging. So this is in Alaska now. Um, and the behavior of this glacier is so dramatic, changes so rapidly, that if we had, for example, weather stations on the glaciers, if we had instruments measuring the speed of the glacier, GPSs, if we had uh, sensors collecting information about the temperature of these glaciers, they would be instantly destroyed by the acceleration of the glaciers. So I wouldn't like to be standing on this, for example, I don't know about you, is that this, it's, uh, it doesn't look very safe. Uh, this is another glacier surging in Alaska. And the glaciers can really go from barely moving to moving at 10, 20, 30 meters per day for a few months to a few years. So this is why we still know so little about them. So today, fortunately, we can use uh, satellite images. We, use, we do a lot of remote sensing on surging glaciers. But the information we need is inside the glaciers, is at the base of these glaciers, between the ice and the bedrock. This is where the key in understanding surging glaciers is. So what do we know about them? Actually, we still know quite a bit. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty. We do know where we can find this kind of behavior. So fortunately, not all the glaciers in the world behave like this. It would make things very, very tricky. So this map represents where we can find this kind of behavior. So in blue, this is where normal glaciers are. And in purple or pink, this is where we have observed some glaciers to surge. So glaciers, when they are of surge type, they tend to repeat this behavior at regular intervals. For example, in Alaska, the glaciers that can behave like this, they can surge every 20 years. In Svalbard, for example, in the Norwegian high Arctic, glaciers take a lot more time to be able to surge again. We find also a lot of them in Iceland, pretty much all the glaciers of Iceland can surge. And the biggest population of surge type glaciers, so glaciers that can surge, is actually found in the western part of the Himalayas. So there are about 900 glaciers there that can surge, so they can produce this big acceleration. And if we count the numbers of the glaciers that can surge and the glaciers that are normal glaciers, there's about 1% of all the glaciers in the world that have been observed to surge. So it's a very, very small population, but they matter a lot. So what do we know? We know that glaciers can only surge if they are found in very specific conditions. So this is why when we look at the map here, for example, we do not find them everywhere in the world. We do not find them in northern Greenland, for example. We do not find them everywhere in the Himalayas. We do not find them at all in the European Alps anymore. So to be able to search, these glaciers have to be found in very specific conditions. And what's interesting is that whether they're found in the Western Himalayas or in Alaska, for example, the climatic envelope is very similar. So glaciers need these specific conditions to be able to produce these big accelerations. What we do know also is that if we look at Alaska, if we look at Svalbard, not all the glaciers there surge. Again, it's just a portion of the population that can produce these big accelerations. But what's for certain is that the glaciers that can surge, they tend to be 
the biggest ones. They tend to be the thickest glaciers, the longest glaciers. And the fact that these glaciers are so much bigger than all the other ones, all the other ones explains a lot about what can trigger the surge. Because the key to surging is water. For a glacier to be able to move at these velocities, to be able to move at 10, 20, 30 meters per day, you do need water in the system, a lot of water that is stuck at the base of the glacier that will lubricate the movement of the glacier and make it move extremely rapidly. So the fact that glaciers are, these glaciers are so much bigger than all the other ones explains that actually these glaciers are struggling to get rid of the water that is within the plumbing system of these glaciers. Imagine if you have a glacier that is two kilometers long or 40 kilometers long, which one is going to have the most difficulties to evacuate the water that it is producing itself or getting from the rain or from melting snow? Of course, the biggest glacier is going to really, really struggle. So this is what we're seeing, that these glaciers tend to be extremely big compared to their neighbors. What is most worrying is that at the moment we're starting to detect that glaciers are starting to surge because of climate change. So we can finally make a direct connection between warming air temperatures by increasing water temperatures and the dynamic of surging of this big acceleration. So what I'm showing you here is what we call a velocity map. So we're looking at this big glacier here in the middle, just here. So this is all black and white, but this is the glacier. And this is a calving glacier, which means this is a glacier that goes all the way to sea level. What's happening is because the oceans are warming, and this is in Svalbard, this is in the heart of the Arctic, because the oceans are warming so quickly, because these glaciers are melting so rapidly, these processes can actually make the glaciers accelerate, which is really counterintuitive. We're more used to seeing glaciers retreating very, very quickly, but in some parts of the world, the glaciers change behavior and it makes them accelerate. So this glacier was moving at four meters per day during the surge, during the acceleration, which for Svalbard is very, very fast, actually. This is a very impressive dynamic. So why, actually, why should we care <laughs> about these glaciers that accelerate and, and the fact that these accelerations can be linked to climate change? First of all, because when a glacier is surging, when a glacier is accelerating, the glaciers can sometimes advance over big distances. So the glacier you can see here in the image, this is again a glacier in Svalbard. As the result of the surge, the glacier advanced over six kilometers. And these six kilometers of ice, they shouldn't be here. This is not at all in equilibrium with the climate. So what will happen is that these six kilometers of ice will melt extremely rapidly, much faster than what normal glaciers would do. So these six kilometers of ice will disappear very, very quickly. But also for the glaciers, we have seen that glaciers, as the result of a surge, can lose up to 80% of their volume. So for a glacier, this is irreversible. It's very, very hard for a glacier to be able to get back into normal, to get back to accumulating mass as the result of the surge. So for some of these glaciers, a surge is the kind of the end of the glacier. It means that the glacier will lose too much volume to be able to recover. Also, why should we care? Because of the hazards these glaciers can cause. So of course in Svalbard it's a very particular condition, but we use glaciers for transportation because it is usually very safe to drive snowmobiles on glaciers. So for indigenous communities it is actually a big problem, but also for the people in Svalbard. Also if you look at a glacier that is moving extremely quickly, it is definitely destroying everything around it. There's nothing stopping it. I mean, you cannot be build walls, uh, fences or barriers. There's nothing stopping these glaciers. Also, this will really perturb how much water is coming from these glaciers. And this is something we are starting to see a lot of in the Himalayas. Remember I told you there is a big population of surging glaciers in the western part of the Himalayas. So this is the Karakoram Pamirs. And I'm going to show you a video of a glacier surging currently in the Karakoram. 
It is moving, I think, between 15 and 20 meters per day at the moment. So this is the Schisper Glacier. As you can see, it is extremely dramatic. So all of this is moving ice. And the problem is when countries rely on meltwater coming from these glaciers, rely on a constant discharge of water, well, these glaciers completely change everything. Not only during the surge, there is barely any water coming from these glaciers because the water is stuck under the glaciers. It's not going anywhere. But also, if these glaciers, look at this monster, if these glaciers meet rivers, they're going to block the rivers and the water will not go to the communities downstream. So if these communities rely on water for irrigation, rely on water for hydro, rely on water simply for drinking, it is a big problem because these glaciers really, really change the game. But also, when you look at a drone video like this one, you can see that lakes are forming all around the glacier because the glacier is blocking the flow of rivers from around it. So what will happen is that eventually lakes, the volume of these lakes will increase and these lakes will always manage to drain eventually. And that's a big problem in the Himalayas at the moment. We're st starting to see these lakes forming everywhere. But these surging glaciers can be a big problem because they can also create new lakes. These lakes will drain catastrophically and this will really affect the communities downstream. So surging glaciers are impacting the populations living in all of these purple areas on the map. Of course, it's a tiny proportion of all the glaciers in the world, fortunately. But climate change is really changing where surging glaciers are found and really changing the way glaciers are behaving. So this is really something we, could, we should pay attention to. And hopefully, by knowing more about these surging glaciers, we will be able to raise ambitions and really readjust the NDCs. So thank you very much. And again, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. And um, we'll leave the floor to oh, Joe. This is the first slide. No, hang on. Sorry about that. I'll go back to slide number one. Sorry, we have a very slow computer. <laughs> so here we are. Joe Robertson, the floor is yours. <laughs> so I think this has been an incredibly fascinating uh, discussion about what's happening to the planet itself. Um, I want to say a few words uh, of introduction uh, about what this image is. It was taken by a friend of mine um, named David Thorson. David is a photographer, an explorer, and he's the only American who has sailed in both directions through the Northwest Passage successfully. Um, the reason that is important is that on this journey in 2007, um, David and the crew of this small boat were trying to replicate an earlier attempt that they made in 1994. In 1994, they couldn't make it through the Northwest Passage from east to west. They got stuck in the ice. They had to turn back. It was a dangerous situation. Um, in 2007, they were able to see, because now you know, satellite imagery had become available to the public, they were able to see that there was actually a lot less ice in the Northwest Passage, and they decided to try again. So 13 years, thinking about that in the span of the life of the planet, 13 years is not a long time. In 2007, they were able to sail 7,000 miles without touching any ice. 7,000 miles. So they succeeded in making that journey, but David would say that he feels there's an asterisk next to the accomplishment because they had a lot of help from climate change. Um, and he had a moment during that trip where he had taken a picture where they got stuck in the ice, and then he took a picture at the same place 13 years later. And 13 years later, it looks like the Caribbean. It's a sunny day, the sun is low on the horizon, the water is clear, blue, still as, day, as uh, a mirror. But 
When he shows that image, people kind of feel like they're there with him, and he describes the feeling he had, which is that, he, that they had entered a new age of exploration. And the way he put that is that it's no longer about exploring the surface of the planet. We've done that. We can see it from space. Now we're exploring the, the Earth's systems. How does the planet work? We need to know that for the reasons we've been hearing about. Um, the next thing that I want to share about this is that, like I said earlier, a lot of I think most of us tend to think that these kind of landscapes are far away. They're not directly connected to our experience. And one very, very real and direct impact of melting glaciers, obviously, is sea level rise. There's something about sea level rise that people tend not to fully understand. Um, because most people haven't experienced something like that, a relatively quick surge in the overall amount of water in your community that never goes away, right? It's not a puddle from a rainstorm. It's not a creek that suddenly becomes a torrent and 12 hours later is a creek again. Uh, and it's not a storm surge from a hurricane that goes away after a few weeks. Um, it is the ocean pushing further and further and further into your community and never going back. It is the weight of all of that water across the entire planet pushing against all of your infrastructure. What cities are finding is that it's a lot harder to actually guard against that than was previously understood because our defenses tend to be for the level of saltwater intrusion we're used to. But as it accumulates, the pressure is more and we're not as prepared. Um, I want to share another anecdote, which is a few years ago, there was a, a water day in New York City, and the head of the Army Corps of Engineers for the region was giving a talk about how to prevent storm surges from invading New York City again, um, as they did in Hurricane Sandy. And someone in the audience said, Aren't, isn't there a plan to build a wall? You can build a wall from Sandy Hook, New Jersey, to Coney Island, Brooklyn. The problem, I, there are people who maybe know the region who are laughing, the problem, I'm from there, I'm from this, the Sandy Hook side of that, that wall, is that the places at the end of the wall are less than a foot above sea level. So if you build a wall to stop the storm surge, but you don't extend it all the way the length of Long Island and all the way the length of New Jersey, the water's just going to go around, right? So you can maybe slow down the flood, but you can't stop it. Um, and so the head of the Army Corps of Engineers explained they are looking into that because they've been asked to look into it by elected officials because there's a lot of public pressure, but that the cost would likely be twice what they think it is. And after 20 to 30 years of building, the science suggests that whatever we're planning for now probably won't be good enough. So I share that because Melting ice eventually comes to your front door, and it comes much faster than you think. Um, but I want to share one more story about the teleconnection, the remote landscape invading our local experience, which is that you know, our planet has stratified climate bands. We're not used to thinking of it that way because it doesn't really look that way. You can look at Saturn and you see neat stripes across the planet. Earth doesn't look like that. But there is a separation between the polar regions and the more temperate zones and the subtropical and tropical regions that is fairly well defined. And that's because there are anchors for those climate bands. The ice in the high mountains and in the polar regions anchors our climate system. And so just like sea level rise is gonna change the shape of Florida and New Jersey and New York and Bangladesh, um, the fact that that ice is there shapes where we can grow food, where we build cities, along rivers, whether drinking water will be available, which landlocked countries have enough water to get by and which don't. That can lead to conflict along borders where there's a problem with access to the water, to shipping, to trade, etc. So whether that ice stays where it is supposed to be, according to the nature of our planet or not, shapes everything that we do every day. It will determine the price of milk. It will determine the price of bread. It will determine what kind of fibers can go into the clothes that you wear. It will determine where jobs exist, 
which kind of institutions invest in what activities, for what purpose, for how long, who benefits from that. It'll determine whether a million people or 10 million people or 100 million people migrate and how fast, right? There is actually a kind of signal where a surging glacier tells us about essentially a cryospheric failure. That can also be an indication that the failure of institutions could follow. And it may not be where you think, right? The, the glacier that's failing in the Arctic might influence a population very far away in a completely different type of scenario. Um, so, you're just to hit the button. Um, so, we're here at the COP25, and I said earlier, nation states are going to be required to upgrade the ambition of their climate commitments. And we're still sort of using the language of a few years ago where we're making pledges to do something in the future for the benefit of all. But the reality is that this is not just a legal requirement or a kind of diplomatic peer pressure. This must happen or the cost of failing will affect everyone. Nation states will fail soon. And they, there will be a ripple effect to their failure. Um, we've seen that in the situation that Syria has had to deal with, with drought and political upheaval and then repression coinciding and creating chaos across the entire region. Um, our way of thinking about how countries can do this upgrading is to focus on these five things that we think don't get enough attention. One of them is public participation. Our view is that public participation doesn't make it harder, it makes it easier to succeed. Instead of guessing what people want and then trying to convince them that they really do want it when it wasn't well enough designed for their circumstances, get them to help you design the future that they want. Do that in a way that matches the science, get people involved in that. One of the inconvenient facts about public engagement is that for people in government, the public tends to demand a much higher level of performance than politics would allow. But that's where we are. We need that higher level of performance. So this is something we should think about and try to make sure that people everywhere have an opportunity to have a say and say, these are the things we value. Carbon dividends, I'm not going to go into the policy right now, but we need to change the price signal so that we're not polluting. We're not just polluting for free. We're paying trillions of dollars a year to companies that generate pollution that disrupts the climate. Um, an astrophysicist talking about the change in our polar regions pointed out a couple of years ago, if we saw this happening on a moon of Saturn, we would be alarmed at how fast that celestial body is changing and what that might mean for the possibility of life on that world. It's happening in our world, which is the only one we can live in, and we're not as alarmed, right? So. We need to change the price signals. The benefit of dividends is that a country can do that on their own. They don't need an international agreement to help shape it to make the rules. The money goes back to people, and what ends up happening is people have a thriving economy that is aligned with climate intelligence. They're going to get a cleaner outcome, a more stable world, and a more stable, fairer economy. Climate smart finance. We want to take the conversation about finance not entirely away from dedicated additional public sector spending, but we want to take it into the mainstream. We want all finance everywhere to be climate smart. It doesn't make sense for any money anywhere to be creating harm that can be avoided. But that's where we are now. Where we are right now is that pretty much every unit of currency exchanged everywhere in the world is creating some avoidable harm and it's at planetary scale. If we're going to change that, we need to have as a goal, and we need to think about it as a scientifically relevant goal, that all money everywhere should be climate smart. Just having that in mind helps negotiators, political leaders, ministers think about what it means to build science into policy. Part of our agenda is to talk about the ocean and watersheds, but Behind that is the cryosphere, right? It's the, sort of a, it's a trickle-down effect. You have the cryosphere, the watershed, the ocean. And in the watershed, you have everything that we do. You have 
agriculture, you have cities, you have transportation, energy production, all of those things are happening along the journey down to the ocean. If we want to keep the ocean clean, we have to clean up everything before the ocean. And if we want to prevent sea level from rising, we have to protect the cryosphere. And I think getting our minds around that idea that this is an integrated process, right? That investing in, in you know, the blue economy means investing in ocean safe activities all the way upstream and it means protecting the cryosphere. And then nature-based solutions. This is controversial. Some people think that nature-based solutions are a way to you know, sink carbon and let pollution happen anyway. We need to do so much better than that. Um, but nature-based solutions have a tremendous potential to help us draw down climate-forcing uh, compounds from the atmosphere into land, into forests. If we do it in the right way, where agriculture is clean, the chemical industry is clean, energy is clean, then the ocean will also be cleaner, less acidic, and will actually also be able to help sink carbon. We'll be able to restore biodiversity on land and in the water, which is a way of sinking carbon. Um, all of these things are part of stabilizing the climate, and they are all investable because they all connect back to the things we do every day. And so, uh, in a way, I think what what we want to talk about when we talk to diplomats involved in this process, when we talk to political leaders uh, in our respective cities and countries, is we want to think about these teleconnections and try to help people understand that those teleconnections are not as remote as people tend to think. I think we all know people who still remember when it wasn't common to have you know, low-cost access to telephone communications and they'll yell into a phone as if they're screaming across the world. Now we've gotten used to seeing each other through the internet and it's much more common to think of people on the other side of the world as people you see every day. In our organization, uh, in Citizens Climate Lobby, we have 173,000 people in 52 countries. Many of those people have been interacting for years and have never met. The teleconnection is actually fairly close. And there's a way in which human activity and our effect on the environment is reflecting, they're reflecting each other, right? Our ethical entanglement with each other is embodied by the geophysics of the planet. Um, I want to just say a word here about what might lie behind thinking about science becoming part of NDCs. This is a... This is a representation of the breakdown of climate smart finance tracked by a research fellow working with us on this project we call Resilience Intel. We think generally about the dedicated additional public sector spending and you'll see the second from the top government, 72.9 billion. It's pretty good, but look at the slice of the pie. It's not a very big slice of the pie and it will never be a very big slice of the pie because Governments don't control everything, and that's for the better, probably. Um, but actually, already, banks and private financial institutions, uh, bond issuers and traders, including sovereign bonds, which are government, multilateral development banks, are deploying climate finance, but their total commitments are huge. Since 2011, through the end of 2018, the total amount of climate smart finance committed by these five sectors was $3.56 trillion. Now, most of that has not yet been invested anywhere, and much of it hasn't even been capitalized, meaning it's notional. It will exist someday. It'll just be moved from one thing to another. Dirty money will become clean money. Uh, but it's not moving yet. The big story is that in the last year, in fact, just the el first 11 months of this year, those commitments increased 54%. So the total committed from 2011 for spending out to 2030, between 2011 and 2018, eight years, has just expanded by 54% in 11 months. Now we have 5.46, uh, $5.48 trillion out there waiting to be used, right? Now, in a way, this is what everyone here is trying to figure out. How do we 
use the science to make smart decisions about how people should live. Ideally, they'll be better off, they'll be living better lives. Do all of that in a way where we're good stewards of the planet and have a better, more stable economies that are more just, more prosperous, um, and not doing harm. The opportunity is there. So we think that we actually need to have science in finance. We need to draw direct connections. What we'd like to see happen is, and this is really what Resilience Intel is about, we'd like to see science data platforms, even raw data, you know, more than 80% of the raw data that's pulled down uh, by NOAA, the, the US uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, is never processed. It exists, it's stored, it can be studied, but it's not processed into a form that's ready to be used because there's just not enough time in the day to do it all. If we can connect Earth observing science platforms to, to financial data flows, which are the fastest moving kind of information in the world. They're accumulating faster than almost any other kind of information. They move at the speed of light. Money is changing hands constantly throughout the day, 24 hours a day, and it's soon gonna be seven days a week. Those decisions are not being made based on what's good for the planet. And we can't inform all of those decision makers about how to be climate responsible. Um, we can't expect them to become PhDs before we solve this problem. We don't have enough time. So if we can make the connection between earth science platforms and finance platforms so that we can think about this one big thing, which fortunately the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are thinking about. It's called macro critical resilience. What that means is resilience across all of the things that shape what is possible for human beings. So we might not value rainfall in the marketplace, but if we don't have it, civilization breaks down. So it's clearly more valuable than most everything else we do price. Now, if we could measure that, if we could compare the companies that are causing the disruption of natural systems and say those are less valuable companies than the ones that are protecting natural systems, we could then demonstrate that there's a higher return on investment across the whole economy. By doing that, the public sector could shift incentives to say, if it turns out that while you're making money for yourselves and a handful of people and you've created a few thousand jobs, we now have hundreds of millions of people who don't have enough food, who can't afford to live, who are losing their homes, migrating with no plan, that is not affordable for the rest of us, right? So incentives can shift. And as that plays out, what you start to get is this very simple thing that could happen in the financial sector where someone could look at three options. They're relatively the same. Same kind of company, same kind of profitability, et cetera, et cetera. Same kind of credit rating, historically very similar. But one big difference, one of them has a very high macro critical resilience value the other two don't. Well, then you know, whether you like it or not, whether you care about the politics or not, whether you care about the planet or not, you know that that company is more likely to be around in a few years. You invest in that one. You don't need to care. You don't need to understand it. You just need to know the higher number means do it. And that's how the financial sector makes a lot of decisions. So there are ways that we can actually make these connections where the knowledge the understanding that's coming from science. It can be shared the way we're sharing it here, talking, getting into detail, learning from each other. It can be shared by people traveling to different parts of the world and becoming experts. Um, but we can also operationalize it. We, we are in a place where we are connected enough to do that now. And so our hope is that this is one of the things that's going to emerge from this negotiating process over the next year. Instead of all of us sort of throwing up our hands and saying, how do you invest in the cryosphere? This is what we should be thinking about. We can connect science to finance. We can connect macrocritical resilience to national policy. Any country that's not doing that, frankly, is crazy. Because if you're not macrocritically resilient, your country will fail. Your economy will fail. And the richest economies in the world have very little tolerance for even small decreases 
in their growth, let alone actual decreases in overall wealth. That is an important pressure. And if we can draw those connections, help people understand, I think we can actually significantly increase the ambition of NDCs. A final note that I want to make about this, because I think it's an important point of conversation. You know, here at the COP, um, people work hard. There's not a lot of time to sleep. People are drinking coffee all the time. Um, they're handing out free chocolate to try to remind you that the chocolate growing regions of the world are under stress. We have coffee, we have chocolate because there is ice. If we didn't have those clearly defined climate bands, we wouldn't have stable agricultural systems. We wouldn't have stable water cycles that deliver relatively routinely the right kind of weather, the right kind of water supply to the places where we've chosen to build our civilization. And what we have to keep in mind is if that's all disrupted, it's not like we just move to the place where the water went. It might not stay there. A disrupted world is disrupted. It's not necessarily stable in a new way. Uh, it's not necessarily conducive to the survival of our species or our civilization. So um, remind people the things they value, the, the coffee, the chocolate, the whatever their favorite food is, or the places they love to look at, or the air they love to breathe, those things exist because there is ice. We have to value that and we have to learn how to talk about it as a matter of public priority. So, do we have um, any questions, or do we have a... Huh? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That yeah. was very, very insightful. Um, Thank you very much, Joe. That was very, very insightful. Um, I know that there's a lot of scientists actually watching mm -hmm. the live stream, and I'm sure that, just like me, many of them are wondering, what can we do on our level? What can we do? How can we get in touch with your project? Yeah. So, well, the easiest way to get in touch is just to go to resilienceintel.org and you can, you can contact us there and we can have that conversation about what's the best way to, to do things. You can reach me also at jr at citizensclimate.org. Um, but in terms of on the level of science, you know, I think it's fair to say that scientists have to be very careful about how truth is communicated. Scientific truth has a much higher uh, burden of proof than any other kind of truth-telling, right? And that's for all of our benefit. But it also means that the public communication of science is often more conservative and less alarming. Um, and so the first thing I would say is that scientists like the two of you need to be engaged. You're engaged. Um, engagement is good. And that engagement doesn't have to be scientific, right? Our political engagement is much more cultural, it is much more about common values. Those are the things that we need to connect around. Um, that's one thing. I would say that Isatis has experience um, organizing citizens' assemblies with people of all different kinds of uh, levels of influence and expertise. And we were talking yesterday, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Isatis, but we were talking yesterday about how that differentiation is actually very valuable because when people come from such different perspectives, they have to connect around something and it brings them to their values. And you suddenly get new connections that lead to a new vision of what's possible. Um, so participating in those kind of venues, I think, is very important. I don't know if you want to say anything, Isatis. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have organized a series of citizens' assemblies throughout the whole Latin America. And we have learned that when you have people, so we try to have this as a multi-level engagement. So we have um, people that are part of the policy making or the, uh, of the, or the planning, but also scientists. And more importantly for us, because that's the people that we want to engage and they're not normally engaged, are community um, people, individuals that normally don't have um, I mean, they're concerned about climate change, but normally don't think about it as what are the policy recommendations that I could do. So we want them in the room because they have the local knowledge about what's happening, what's important, and what's the best way. And, and a lot of them have insights on um, projects that they are working on on their um, community. Um, some because they're addressing 
other concerns like for example you have communities that have um, community gardens you have communities that plant mangroves you have community that plant coral reefs and that can be in combination with other um, organizations that are around them but the main point is that this integral response if we scale it up we have more ambition for any country like any region can raise ambition just by bringing people in and gauging what are their resources and the capacity that they have so we can build resilience both like from government to individuals and then from individuals to government that's really great uh, that was a great synopsis of what is happening and also i think it's a great response to the question because in those communities you have you have a need for the scientific information about what works or what might work. And then you have people coming together about around what kind of quality of life do we want? What kind of community experience do we want? Do we want, you know, a leafier, cleaner kind of air to breathe, frankly? Do we want the protections that come from mangroves versus not? And there are places that you know, right, where if the mangroves are there, the town stays there after the storm. If they're not there, it's gone. Um, and so by letting people say, we want that, and then work on it together, that's a, a great opportunity. And the other thing I wanted to say about this, how scientists can connect with something like this. So there's a, there's a sort of in-between, between what Isatis is talking about and this sort of planetary scale system which is that there need to be knowledge exchange networks. We, we're kind of calling them situation rooms because there's a sense of urgency about addressing the emergency. But those situation rooms can be a group of people who meet once a month. They can be a group of people spread across the world who have a common thematic interest. They can be an opportunity for various cities to share knowledge, to try to learn about flood defenses or to try to learn about other nature-based solutions, et cetera. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that people in the financial sector are going to go out and say, I need a scientist. But by helping to build these knowledge exchange networks, they can be brought into the discussion. And when they discover that there is a broader landscape of value that they've been ignoring, that is information people respond to. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I think that's all for today. Um, if you have any further questions, it's possible to follow up on the Cryosphere Pavilion Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash COP25 Cryosphere Pavilion. Um, you can also follow up with us at resilienceintel.org. And we also are tracking our engagement here at the COP25 through engageforclimate.org, the number four, engageforclimate.org. So thank you, everybody. I hope we continue working together.
Buenas tardes, everyone. <laughs> it is great to see you all here this afternoon. So we have a fantastic side event in store for you. And today, as you know, is a, a day focusing on mountain glaciers and mountain snow. But this side event is focusing exclusively on tropical glaciers. And we feel that tropical glaciers have kind of been forgotten in these discussions on melting glaciers, on retreating glaciers. Today, we still have tropical glaciers, about 3,000 of them, in three different regions of the world. And these glaciers truly are on the front line of climate change. These glaciers are disappearing so quickly, affecting many mountain communities along the way. So we're very lucky to have many experts focusing on tropical glaciers today. We're going to start with Dirk Hoffman. Dirk is the coordinator of the Bolivian Mountain Institute and he's been working on sustainable mountain developments in Bolivia for a very long time. And with us today, he will share an overview on the science on tropical glaciers. Just after Dirk, we're going to have two people coming from very, very far away, which are dear friends of mine. They are Marcela Fernandez, who is the leader of Cumbres Blancas Colombia with Estefania Angel. Cumbres Blancas Colombia is a grassroots project. These are not scientists, they're not explorers, they're not climbers, they are citizens who care so very much about the glaciers of Colombia. And they've managed to create a multidisciplinary team to try to raise awareness about the tropical glaciers of that country. So first of all, we're going to start with Dirk Hoffman from the Bolivian Mountain Institute. Thank you. Well, thank you much, very much for the introduction. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Uh, we will speak in English today. Uh, we work in, in Spanish usually, but um, we're at the COP, so, so English is the language. We will be talking about... Um, about the overview of the world's tropical glaciers, present state impacts and perspectives in a rapidly warming world. But first of all, we've just heard we have tropical glaciers in different parts of the world. And on this map, you can identify the three regions. You have tropical glaciers. Well, I have to talk here. We have tropical glaciers in uh, the Andes of South America, we also do find them in, in East Africa still. And there's one place in Australasia, in Indonesia, where you, always, where you also have uh, one last tropical glacier left. So this is very important to know that we have them in three continents, because that was very important for scientists to establish what was happening in one region was not a regional phenomena, but was something that it was happening around the globe. It was a global phenomena which allowed, in part, to trace glacier ret retreat back to global warming. That's another view. We have 99% of the tropical glaciers in the Andes. Uh, you can see on this global map, uh, East African glaciers and Irian Jaya glaciers are not even contemplated because they're too small in size if you talk about sea level rise and, and water equivalent. And you can also see, if you focus on, on South America, that uh, number 16 is the tropical glaciers and 17 is the Andean glaciers, the southern Andean glaciers, that they are much, much bigger and much more uh, important in terms of contribution to sea level rise. But you can see by the size of the circles that the major masses of, of mountain glaciers are in the northern hemisphere and in the Himalayan region. Well, we're going to, to see the tropical glaciers of country by country, region by region. We start with Indonesia, that's Papua province, known also as Irian Jaya. And there's one glacier left, and we have two, two aerial photographs, satellite photographs actually, from 1988 on the left-hand side, and from 2017 on the right-hand side. And you can see the, the little uh, patches of glacier have been shrinking rapidly, so there's only very small areas left of glaciers. They're difficult to access because you can see on the right-hand side there's a big uh, gray spot, and that's a gold mine, and the gold mine is limiting access to, to all the area around. We move on to East Africa. 
Well, we have glaciers in, in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Tanzania, the most well-known, Mount Kilimanjaro, between two to three kilometers, square kilometers of, of ice left. It's also very, very small and shrinking rapidly. Even smaller, the, the glacier remains on Mount Kenya. From a scientific point of view, there, there is a discussion whether these should be called glaciers still or whether those are not just ice fields that are remains of, of glaciers. But that's economic discussion, so we have ice from glaciers left. But it's not a living glacier and it won't be there for, for much longer. Same holds true for the Rubenzori Mountains in Uganda, bordering with Congo. It's also around one square kilometer of, of glacier ice left. Moving to South, Africa, uh, South America, excuse me, from Africa to South America to the Andes, uh, we have Venezuela in the north, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia with uh, relevant tropical glaciers, the last two countries. We look at Venezuela, there's one glacier left. That's a photograph uh, from April of this year. It's a Humboldt glacier, uh, also less than one square kilometer in size. So together with the glaciers in, in uh, Indonesia and East Africa, those glaciers will last for a couple of years, few decades, no more than that. And they're very small and they have a very local importance. We're moving to Colombia. Uh, well, we have six glaciers left with an area of approximately 45 square kilometers at the moment. I will not talk any more about Colombia because the second presentation will focus exclusively on Colombia. So we'll hear a lot about those glaciers from the two ladies talking after me. Moving on to, to Ecuador, there's seven glaciers left in the country, two of them at the brink of extent, uh, extinction. They were too small to last maybe a couple of more years. Some of the others will be around for a little longer. It's about the same size, the same area as we have for Colombia. The latest uh, date, data is 44.5 square kilometers. And we know that over the last 55 years, 60% of glacier area has been lost in Ecuador. And that figure is approximately the same for all the Andean tropical countries. So for Peru and for Bolivia, we have uh, something like the same, the same amount of glacier loss over the last half century. Moving to Bolivia, the country that I mainly work in, that I'm most familiar with, holds 20% of the world's tropical glaciers. Uh, we have the situation, the privileged situation, to have a glacier inventory, a complete glacier inventory, done in the late 1980s, which is basically the baseline before modern climate change related glacier melt set in and that gave us a, a total number of 566 square kilometers and we are now down to less than half of that size in, in Bolivia. Peru holds 70 percent of all tropical glaciers in the world so is the, the main country to focus on if we talk about impacts of glacier recession on the, in, in terms of tropical glaciers. It's the main country if you talk about glove risk, the glacier-like outburst flood risk. Um, there is an institutionalized a setup to, to look at glaciers, to monitor glaciers. There's a gla national glacier atlas, and we can see the copy. There's a, ma a manual on how to monitor glaciers in Peru. They are important more than on local level, they're important national level. So that's a difference with the before-mentioned countries where we have uh, uh, still tropical glaciers left. And we do have an expert from Peru in the room, so if there's any questions that I can't answer in the discussion, there's Randy in the back and he can help out with any information that we would need on, on Peruvian glaciers. So we move to the next question, why are tropical glaciers melting so fast? There's a number of reasons, and we won't go into much detail because time is limited, but just giving you the main regions, reasons, tropical glaciers are very climate sensitive. And that's, for one reason, obvious because they're very close to the, to the equator. They're in the tropical zones that are warm zones. Uh, global warming is more extreme at higher elevations. That's another important uh, fact. Climate change has changed precipitation patterns. That has also an impact on, on glaciers. 
And we have the effect of El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a natural phenomenon basically, but there is scientific evidence coming up indicating that strong El Nino events are probably becoming more frequent now and in the future. And strong El Nino events have a tendency to melt glaciers much faster. In those years that we have a strong El Nino, at least in Bolivia and Peru, glacier mass is lost more rapidly than in regular years. Uh, we have other impacts as well, um, the effect of black carbon on the glaciers. That is mainly from agricultural burning in the Amazon lowlands. But there's also coming from urban contamination where glaciers are close to urban centers and there's dust accumulating on, on white surface that also accelerates the melting. We do have very little exact data on this. The first studies are already, uh, only now coming out. There's one uh, I'm referring here to. Uh, that came out last month, I think, on the Amazon biomass burning, enhancing tropical and glaciers melting, trying to put figures to this relationship that we know the relationship exists, but we don't have scientific figures to, to prove how important is really the Amazon burning. Um, if we, oh, I got the Spanish one here, sorry. Uh, so that's the loss of, of glacier mass from different regions under different temperature scenarios. And um, this is basically data from Ben Marzion from the Institute of Atmospheric and Cryospheric Sciences. The reference is not there. Ben Marzion should be here. And uh, if we look at glacier mass loss, we can see the, on the lower left-hand side the low latitudes, and that would be the tropical glaciers. And we can see that they will be completely lost in very short time. Independent of, basically independent of the, uh, the climate pathway, the emission pathway that we look at. If we look at southern Andes and central Europe, we see a much, much bigger difference between the, the emission scenario and the impact on glaciers. So mountain glaciers on the whole will survive a lot more if we uh, mitigate rapidly, whereas the tropical mountain glaciers mainly uh, will disappear independently of uh, emission trajectories. We'll come back to that later on. Why are those glaciers important? We've said that they're small and there's only a few in the world, and that, but they're still very important. They're important for hydrological cycles locally. There's people living there, and that's something we forget sometimes. If, if we look at uh, glacier uh, science, we have mass balance and all this. But there's people involved. We always have to make this link. Where does natural science link up with the social situation, with the people directly impacted? We have impacts on high Andean wetlands, on bofedales and paramos, on livelihoods and on mountain culture. In many areas of the mountains, when you don't have permanent water, and glaciers give off water during the dry season, so that is important for the local ecosystems, and that's important for herding. And herding is important for people to live in the mountains. So if you don't have this, you will lose mountain culture. And that's an important uh, point to, to make. We also have the importance of water for urban centers. Lima, La Paz, El Alto, to mention three big cities that partially depend on, on glacier melt for their drinking water. They partially depend. Most of the water for La Paz and El Alto is rainwater. It's not completely dependent on glaciers. Glacier water make up something like 12%. So it's not huge, but it's, it's a figure. 12% is real. We have impacts on tourism, on sports, and on cultural values. Here's the example of the Chakataya ski slope, the highest ski slope in the world with a lift. If you look at any of the tour guides, uh, uh, tour books from 10 years ago, it, it, it said that. We had international ski competitions on that mountain. You can see the last remaining bit of ice on the, on the right photograph. And during the El Nino 2009-2010, um, the glacier disappeared completely. So there is no glacier anymore on Chacaltaya Mountain. And this is an iconic mountain for the population of La Paz. So this is a, a, where climate change becomes visible to an urban population. The other importance is tropical glaciers are climate archives, like all glaciers. The older ice on the bottom gives you clues about the composition of the atmosphere many thousand years ago. 
And there's a couple of places where uh, glaciers have been drilled in Bolivia and other countries. That's a recent photograph from Mount Huascaran in Peru, where the glacier had been um, perforated just a couple of years ago to get more detailed knowledge about past climate situation in the Andean mountains. So this will be lost if we lose the glaciers. Tropical glaciers and sea level rise are, this is no, tropical glaciers are not relevant on a global scale if you talk about sea level rise. On the left hand side you can see for the low latitudes and southern Andes they contribute 5% to all tropical glaciers and sea level rise. And as we've seen before, southern Andes is the bigger chunk, so we can approximately think that tropical glaciers are about 1% of all the glaciers' impact on sea level rise. And the impact of mountain glaciers on sea level rise is very small if we compare it to the, to the huge impact of the ice caps of Greenland and of Antarctica. So mountain glaciers in terms of sea level rise, the, the tropical mountains is not relevant, but for all the other reasons I gave before, I think they're very, very important. And they're the most visible sign of climate change. In many other areas and ecosystems, you have to study the change. You need experts, you need biologists to know that the composition of, of microbes in the soil has changed. On tropical glaciers, you take photographs from two different times and anyone who has two eyes can easily see something is happening very fast. And this is, I think, one of the most important things about tropical glaciers. So where are we heading? We're heading towards a world without tropical glaciers or with very few. If we continue on present emission tendencies, and just as a reference, I give the emissions gap report, you probably all know that present day emissions, we're on the trajectory 8.5, which will bring us to global warming of around three, four degrees by the end of the century if nothing serious is done, which is a, a figure that is much, much higher in the tropical Andes. So three to four degrees at the end of the century would be global average, but temperature rise over land masses is higher than average and in higher altitudes, again, it's higher than average. So this is really difficult for, for the tropical glaciers. Here we come back to a slide on mountain glaciers in general, where we can see that there is a substantial difference between 1.5 and two degrees. And that relates back to, to the information from the SR 1.5, the special report that IPCC put out. We can see by the different curves, the red curve is the contribution to sea level rise under a high emission scenario, which we're on at the moment. And you can see the other two curves that are lower emission scenarios. So the contribution to sea level rise will be much less. But this is again on all mountain glaciers. So the tropical part will be just a very tiny part of, of this, like 10%, maybe something, of this graph. That brings us to the urgent need for adaptation in mountain regions affected. And we need a discussion on alternatives of adaptation. There's many different local realities. There's not one solution for the different mountain areas that we've mentioned. Adaptation must be custom tailored, but more than that, it must be integrative and participative. So the people should really be the ones deciding what kind of adaptation is most adequate to them, taking into account the, the socio-ecological situation and their cultural belief system, etc. Um, talking about adaptation would fill another talk. Uh, we don't have the time, so we just leave it with that one slide. But this is obviously a very, very important topic for, uh, locally and for Peru even on a, on a national level. Coming to the take-home message, uh, last slide. Summing up, with the exception of Peru, tropical glaciers are only relevant locally. All small and low-lying glaciers will disappear over the next decades, and that's true for all the tropical regions. Some of the larger and higher glaciers, especially those in Peru and Bolivia, they have a good chance of uh, being there, in a, smaller than they're now, but being there by the end of the century still. And for them, it makes a difference whether we mitigate rapidly and, and profoundly or not. Because of their high sensitivity, tropical glaciers are excellent indicators of climate change. This is something that I think is still under 
underused this argument. We will have uh, the exp uh, exposition from, from Colombia, which is really making, making use of that situation to create awareness and to work with people and to tell what climate change is here, climate change is happening, it's real, it's detectable. And the melting is a very strong warning sign and it's a very strong message to mitigate now and strongly and not wait. There's no time to wait. So thank you very much for the attention. Uh, I will be here for questions after the other presentation and I hand back to... Okay, we go directly to the, to the next speakers. So thank you very much. Estamos de acuerdo que a mediados de los 70 se disparó el derretimiento glaciar como nunca antes se había visto. El clima cambió. No está cambiando, ya cambió. Pues yo creo que es muy importante conectar como nuestra vida cotidiana y nuestros hábitos y entender que tienen un impacto que va más allá de nuestro bienestar y de el bienestar inmediato, digamos, de nuestra comunidad y que realmente está teniendo un impacto en el planeta y generando un peso adicional a los ecosistemas que sostienen la vida, incluyendo la nuestra. Los glaciares en esta región especialmente significan vida, porque representan el agua para más de 3 millones de habitantes, para volver verdes nuestras montañas, sumado a la actividad volcánica que hay acá. Entonces, el, el poderlo recorrer y todavía poder ver lo que son es un privilegio. En septiembre, octubre, el hielo estaba allá arriba. El año pasado. En épocas secas aumenta la radiación, se calienta más el glaciar, se derrite y podemos ver ríos corriendo por acá. O sea, como desangrándose el glaciar. Solamente ver el borde del glaciar fue como desolador. Uno ha oído mucho que a Santa Isabel le quedan 10 años, pero con lo que yo vi yo creo que le quedan mucho menos de 10. Aquí se hace demasiada deforestación para tener ganadería. El año pasado se deforestó más o menos 220 mil hectáreas. Todo eso está haciendo que estos glaciares se estén descongelando, o sea, se está liberando mucho carbono a la atmósfera. Tumbar un bosque libera demasiado CO2. 70% del agua viene acá. Si se afectan los páramos porque se descongelaron esos, esos nevados, esos picos nevados, se afecta el páramo, ese ecosistema, se desequilibra todo. Para que todos los colombianos seamos conscientes de la dimensión que tienen nuestras acciones sobre este hogar en el cual vivimos. Cuando la ves con ese manto blanco que poco a poco desaparece, es, es básicamente ver llorar una montaña, ¿cierto? Se van escurriendo como lágrimas desde su ladera.
Colombia from Colombia and we are very very happy to be here at the Cryosphere Pavilion because for us this pavilion represents the journey that we've had since December last year. We've been on a learning journey as Heidi mentioned we are not scientists, we are not mountaineers, we are just Colombian citizens that realize that we had six tropical glaciers left. We, we had no clue what a tropical glacier was and we, we were not aware that we had six in our country. And not only that we had six, but that we lost 13 and we were not there to witness that. Um, so Cumbres Blancas is the result of this ignorance and this frustration and uh, we decided to come up with this project uh, led by citizens, grassroots, it's a multidisciplinary project in which we mixed um, a glaciologist, of course, like Heidi, but in Colombia we only have one. Uh, his name is Jorge Ceballos, he's the hero of our six glaciers. And of course, we decided to partner up with him and photographers, documentalists, influencers, uh, graphic designers, mountaineers that represent Colombia in the high peaks of the high continental peaks um, and, and us. Um, so it's a group of people that decided to um, do something about what is going on with the glaciers. Of course, the first step is understanding that no matter what we do, it's a goodbye, right? And I think for us it has been a, a lesson to, to deal with this reality and to not be so nostalgic about it because we believe that we can still do something to maybe extend their life. But it, we understand that it has to be a radical and massive change in the mindset of citizens. So we are using our glaciers as an excuse um, to kind of tell people that every action that we do in the city, it's melting them, right? And through this presentation, um, Tefi is gonna explain you a little bit more. You're gonna be seeing pictures of the six glaciers. Uh, the names that you see are in indigenous names because that's the first thing that we decided to do. Start naming them as indigenous call them, right? So the first one that you're seeing, it's called Santa Isabel. Uh, it's the martyr of our project. It's the it's the one that you've you've seen in the present in the video that we just saw, um, and it's also uh, the one that we are taking most care of because it's the first one that we're gonna disappear. Of course, when we talk about them disappearing, it's a conditional. We cannot say that for sure they're gonna disappear in 30 years, but um, from the studies that that they've done. Um, they don't give Santa Isabel more than 10 years, but it could be even less with the recent studies. So Tefi is going to walk us through the presentation and some more experience of what we are doing with Cumbres. So yeah, um, well, the idea of this multidisciplinary group is also understand that science couldn't be only in this um, scientific area and yet you know is that we need to communicate we need to educate the people to understand these numbers these things that sometimes are so overwhelming for the common people and that's the idea we are using our network we are using our expeditions to communicate to the Colombians what is the reality of our country in terms of the melting of the glaciers, but also how are they related with other ecosystems. That's really important for us, because even if the glaciers are gone in a few years, we have the Paramos that provides the 70% of our water in Colombia. And also um, we have a when the glaciers disappear, these super paramos that are really meaningful for us because even the people doesn't know that they are there. And we didn't say goodbye, as Marcy said, that because for us, the symbolic part, being involved with the communities in the high mountains, but also with the indigenous people. We have two glaciers that are sierras, and they are protected and are closed for the public because the indigenous consider that they need to be protected and not be touched. So that's a thing that we are dealing, and also we are being part of this conversation. Even we represent less than 100%. This view is from Bogota, from our capital, and the people always say like, oh, that's uh, like a Photoshop or something, because you wouldn't believe that from the uh, capital, you could see uh, Tolima, that is other of our 
Nevada. So we are trying to get to these citizens that they feel apart from the glaciers, because of course in Colombia for being in the mm, glaciers near is like maybe eight hours from the capital, mm -hmm. less or less. So yeah, of course they feel it afar, but how this affect you and how could you with your daily actions, with your habits, with your demands also in uh, political publics and also with the change in the private sector, we could do something for, for Glacier. So I think combined science uh, when education is the key, uh, also I know that Heidi promotes this because um, it's part of the change, you know? If science only stays in the scientific or in the COP, we are not doing anything. And more in countries like us, that we have a lack in many aspects and maybe glaciers are less of our mothers in this moment in our country. So, yeah. So out of the six glaciers that we have, um, IDEAM, which is the monitoring institution, it's monitoring two of them. Um, and uh, the direct, mm -hmm. direct monitoring, the other four are monitored by satellite, which is not enough. Uh, consider that most of these uh, glaciers that are not monitored are 10 days of expedition. You need to walk 10 days to reach the glacier. Um, and uh, well, when, when we created this project, it's good for you to understand that we were all strangers. We didn't know each other, <laughs> and the cause made us become family and friends, right? And we're going to show you some pictures of who they are. Um, and when, when, when the idea came up uh, to my mind, because of seeing a newspaper and, being, and feeling very frustrated, um, the idea was to create a book and a documentary to really honor and collect all this information. So if they're gonna disappear, they don't go in vain, right? Um, and then later on, I also wanna tell you the story of how we ended up talking in the Cryosphere Pavilion. Um, and when we were watching documentaries uh, for references to build our own documentary, and of course learning on all this topic, um, I watch One Strange Rock. And uh, in the first episode, there was Heidi Sevestre over here, and uh, it was it said glaciologist. So I never imagined that in my life I was gonna be hunting glaciologists, <laughs> uh, and now I do. Every time that I travel, I'm looking for the glaciologist wherever I am. Where are the closest glaciers? So I reach out to her in Instagram, and two days after we were having a conversation in April, and in November uh, she spent two weeks in our country. And it was an amazing experience, uh, not only because uh, she's very good <laughs> at telling people what tropical glaciers are, and through her, I think we created without planning a mediatic excuse for press to talk about our tropical glaciers and a glaciologist that, start, that study glaciers in the Arctic and the Antarctica and Himalayas and everywhere to come to our country. And with that, we would love to keep doing it. We would love to invite more people like Heidi, maybe like Dirk, or like some of you that are sitting here that can come and, and research what's going on in our countries and help us. Because not only glaciers are in extinction, but also glaciologists as profession. So we want people in our country to study uh, nature, glaciers, and what's happening, because we cannot just say that they're living and there's nothing else to do. So Heidi was in Colombia, as I was telling you, Hey, do you want to tell us your experience in Colombia? <laughs> and what, what, were, what were you doing there? <laughs> sure, absolutely. So I spent indeed two weeks uh, with Cumbres Blancas in Colombia and with my team. And we were very lucky to be able to go to two different mountain ranges. So we went to La Sierra Nevada del Cocuy Oguican. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually installed a time-lapse camera there um, that was gifted by a French company called Enlapse. And for us, it's all part of this effort to help raise awareness about these glaciers and what's better than time lapse to really show what's happening. And so the second mountain we went to was Santa Isabel. So we've seen a lot of pictures already of this mountain. And there as well, we installed another time lapse. But what was fantastic, I think, with Cumbres Blancas is that first of all, it's getting us, the scientists, to get out of our comfort zone <laughs> and try to really embrace these citizens' efforts. 
uh, try to help us to communicate our science, but you also, you care so deeply about the science. You respect so much the work of uh, Jorge Ceballos, who is actually in the mountains right now. And actually, during one of our trips, you've managed to establish to build this lab on Conejeras, exactly. So you're going to tell us more about this now. Yes. But it was a great, great trip. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much. And something really cool that happened, just to wrap up on Heidi's visit to Colombia, um, we actually talked to the Congress. Uh, we had a public audience, uh, a congresswoman uh, organized it, and we ended up, or she ended up speaking to more than 300 congressmen. And after her visit, things start speeding up. Um, the possibility of having 0.5% of the tax carbon of our country to glaciers, paramos, and Bosque Altandino, and forest, and uh, forest in the highlands. It's a possibility that we still need to push, but that happened because she, she talked, and they also created an accidental commission, which means that different parties and different congressmen will join forces to study paramos, glaciers, and forests, uh, because it's an ecosystem, ecosystems that they are not putting enough attention. So I think all this happened and catapulted uh, because of, of, of Heidi's visit to Colombia. And of course, it made a huge impact in our project, because we had to work super fast to be ready for, for, for the visit and to be on top of science, right? We know that we have to be very careful with the language and that's why we're constantly learning and we're very happy to be here in the Crowdsphere Pavilion the next day, learning from all the other talks that are gonna be happening. And we also would like to show you uh, actually a little video mm -hmm. of the experiments that Heidi was mentioning because when we visited Santa Isabel, we started thinking, what else can we do uh, if the only monitor that they're doing is through these uh, balizas, the, the, the stocks, Balis the stakes. Uh, th they're doing monitoring through stakes. Um, and so far, we have only seven left. Um, and the camera, right? The, 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 the camera that they have plus the time-lapse camera. So we created these experiments with our own hands. It was citizens doing it. Um, and you're going to see it in the in the video, but basically we had to walk all the way with the instruments, install them there, um, and it was really beautiful to see that we, we, have, we didn't have any budget or anything. We just said, okay, what kind of crazy actions can we do to maybe do something for these glaciers? And this is what we did, a little explanation. It's in Spanish, but you'll get to see it. So here we were drilling to be able to put one of the sticks. En la cordillera de los Andes, en Colombia, el glaciar Santa Isabel está próximo a extinguirse. We are at 4,800 meters above. That's the camera. Mediante dos experimentos. Una cobertura de tela intentará disminuir fuertemente el albedo para proteger una parte del glaciar. Igualmente, una malla detendrá los cristales de hielo para que se queden sobre el glaciar. And yeah, this is a little bit to, to show you. Para proteger los glaciares ecuatoriales que están próximos a extinguirse. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, trying, right? What else can we do? Um, and the next time we visit, we might invent a new way to make fake snow or to transform fog into, into snow. It's things that we need to start thinking, thinking outside the box. And uh, now, uh, Tefi is going to show us some comparative, comparative pictures um, of the different glaciers w uh, in the coming years. So yeah, for us, um, it's really important, as we say, the education, and I think this uh, is being doing in, in Europe for some photographers. 
but for us it's really important to understand and imagine the dimension of the melting of the glaciers and af uh, as Dirk show us also with um, the glacier in Peru. So this is like the reality that is happening in Colombia. This is for example the volcan Tolima. Tolima, right? Yeah. And look at the difference. So yeah, for us it's really important to put the conversation. In this moment, Colombia is happening for in many things uh, changing in the social and environmental part. And it was really shocking because uh, last week we were calling by the Ministry of Environment to be in the board of scientifics and environmental organizations for making the change necessary in the country. And we were six hours in presidency with the president and the Ministry of Environment and none of the scientific talks about glaciers until I spoke. So that's only from bringing an idea. The best scientifics around the country were, were in that meeting and no one mentioned glaciers or the importance of them in the Howe Mountain ecosystem. So I think the citizens bring this conversation and now working with the politics for half investment, with the scientific for half this perspective, is uh, a thing that could change the uh, environmental part in our country. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have some stickers and some bra bracelets. Uh, if you want to take uh, the Colombian glaciers with you, and I think maybe we will have some questions for questions. Dirk and for Cumbres Blancas. If Thank you, you want. guys. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Dirk, you want to come? If there's questions, we're happy to answer them. If not, you're also invited to come. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. Thank you so much for these talks. They were very, very insightful. Um, what is the future now for these citizen projects? Do you, th do you see them going into other countries? <laughs> Because I think you're one of the first ones, at least in Cumbres Blancas. I don't know if there's something similar in Bolivia. I'd be curious to know. So yes, actually we're super happy to tell you guys that by coincidence that doesn't exist, our team uh, of two mountaineers is going to Bolivia today. And they're training for Elbrus or Denali? No, Denali. Denali. They're training for Denali. And they're going to meet uh, the Cholitas of Bolivia. And they're going to meet Ponchos Blancos with is, which is also a grassroots initiative in, in Bolivia. We've been in touch virtually, of course, uh, to plan something similar. They've been very inspired by the work that we're doing because they're not as multidisciplinary as, as us. And we would love this project to expand into everywhere where there's a tropical glacier or glaciers um, because we, we think it's really important to, yes, to as, ci as citizens, be advocates of our glaciers, right? Uh, as we were talking, it's a profession that it's also in extinction and there's so many things to focus on that we need to steal some attention uh, for the glaciers and just put them like in the, in, the, in the mouth, in the conversation of politicians, even on Greta, we were studying her speeches and um, I heard her mention glaciers twice and I was present in one of them when she mentioned it. So this is important. And we had this project that it's called The Last Tropical Glaciers. We hope to collaborate because I think it's really important to make documentaries about them, but it's important that when we leave, when we leave the country or wherever a documentalist leave the country, the citizens stay and the project is installed so they can keep doing amazing things uh, wherever, wherever they are. So we hope that through this kind of Cumbres Blancas toolkit, we can inspire others, but for them to be autonomous. They will need a Marcela, they will need an Estefania, and they will need to fly and, and see what, is the needs, uh, what are the needs of their glaciers. Yeah, as you've mentioned, uh, Bolivia, uh, we've been working on a, on a similar project of uh, documentation of photographs, and I have the, the booklet here for anyone to look at. So we, we dug up old photographs, and old, that's 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's not like European old 100 years ago, because you don't have anyone that went uh, to the Bolivian glaciers and took photographs and left them in the country. The first mountaineers that came to Bolivia and took photographs of the mountains took the photos basically with them and they went back to the US or to Europe. 
And so it's very difficult to, to come up with, with photos. But the, on the other hand, glacier retreat is so fast in Bolivia that if you have photos from the 80s or from the 90s even, that is enough to document the change. And that's mm -hmm. a, the lucky thing for us if we do a booklet like this. But if we look at the situation, it is horrible to think we, we're losing so much glacier mass in such a short time. So it's a really difficult. Um, anecdotally, one of the difficulties uh, we had, and I had this again when I went back to some of the glaciers this um, winter, July, August, the Austral winter, the dry season, to take photographs, because you have to do it in the dry season, so you don't capture the snow, but you just capture the ice. That's what you want for the comparison. And we had, the week before, snowfalls like no one could remember hmm. in Bolivia. So I was not able to repeat the photographs that I had planned. So climate change itself played a trick on us documenting climate change. So I don't know what to do with that. I was, obviously, I was annoyed because my project didn't work. But uh, you have to look at the bigger picture. So there's a lot of things going on. And, and we need to get people involved. And what we did, we had this exhibition uh, in a museum in La Paz, bringing the glaciers to the city. So it is very similar to, to the intention you had. And we also have groups of young people working on climate change that are aware of the importance of the glaciers. Uh, 350.org, the, the global movement, they go to the glaciers and they take photographs on the glaciers. So they, they are very, very important for, for the climate movement in, in the country, in Bolivia. Um, okay, I have... Uh, okay, uh, my question is, I'm just thinking about... Um, the relationship in places where the, where the glaciers are still large is still strong. But what about the other countries that you mentioned, uh, like Venezuela or even in Africa, where the glaciers are so small that how is the relationship between the glaciers and the locals? Is it still important for the people? Do they notice the glaciers? Uh, this is a question that I cannot fully answer as I've not been to those countries. And I must tell you, I'm, I was thought about at some point going there and documenting those glaciers. And then I thought about well, not only the cost that would involve, but there's other people doing it locally. So I have access to the documents. I, I know they're important locally to local communities, to indigenous communities for the local ecosystem. I know that through what I read. And then I decided it would not be a good idea for me to fly all, or, all around the world just to have a photograph taken with me next to the glacier. But, but there's local people uh, working on, on glacier issues in, in East Africa and, and in Indonesia as well as in, in Venezuela. So um, we know they're important locally. But if you have one glacier left in Venezuela, it's, it's not affecting a lot of people directly. I think that in most of these countries there's presence of indigenous communities and for them they are sacred, they are the origin of life, they have got they are god or goddesses. So this relation is very very strong. In Colombia it's so strong that it's even blocking science to enter. So three of them today we cannot go because indigenous communities consider us pisanieves, that we are just the ones who are stepping into snow without knowing what's going on. So I think this dialogue is also very important with indigenous communities that most tropical glaciers uh, have. Um, and I think it's not who's wrong or right, it's just a matter of sitting and, and talking about how can together we, we can protect them. And of course, in, in countries where water is strictly dependent on glacier, where there should be more attention. In Colombia, it's not that as, as much the case, but in other countries, of course, there is. And I recommend you a video that is called Vanishing Venezuela, and it's really good and, and tell about some scientists that is stay in the country, even all the crisis, and they even go to the glaciers without the proper shoes, they are without lights in the labs, and they are only staying for the glaciers. So I think that's really brave. And it's, it's called Vanishing Venezuela, I think it's from AFP. Um, and, it's, and it's really important to show how scientists are dealing with this. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. More questions. Ah, more questions. So, yes. yes. <laughs> Another. Uh, 
So I want to know how how easy is to make visible these techniques that you're using in the glaciers about the uh, white uh, textile, I don't know, the white coats that you, how, how is it to put it visible to local communities or, uh, I don't know, to everyone just to say, okay, this is working, I know it works, but how is it to put it visible and how it can be, it can be replicated, you know, yes. from Peru. So we have the same situations around. Yes, so I think that's the cool part of making a network of, gl of tropical glaciers and it's sharing best practices. So in, in Peru, most of the things that we've, we, we've seen is things that have actually been done in Peru. You guys painted some glaciers and it's a matter of testing. In our case, it has been there for only three weeks. Um, so we still need to give more visibility and understand that things like this can happen on a larger scale. Today is just 20 meters of the, of the shirt that it's protecting, but if it works, which is actually showing us it works, one of our guides, uh, of the Cumbres Blancas guides, visited last week and there is already five meters of snow on that 20 meters of t-shirt. Of course it will change, uh, but I think Se uh, centimeters, 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 <laughs> sorry, cent <laughs> we wish meters, <laughs> centimeters. centimeters, so uh, yeah, but they, would, they could disappear the next day, um, so the idea is to use these experiments as pedagogy, and when you teach people that this is happening, they will be more connected with glaciers, because most of them will probably don't go up to see it with their own eyes. I, I would like to add a note of caution, however, um, when I read about this experiment of painting the rocks white so the albedo would be uh, higher and, and would reflect less on the glaciers, and it was a, even a World Bank finance project, mm -hmm. I think uh, if you do it as for experimentation and for pedagogical regions, reasons, that is a good idea. Mm -hmm. But glaciers, tropical glaciers will be lost. The, the, the Colombian glaciers will not be rescued. Mm -hmm and giving the impression to the public that we can do our tricks and, and find some technology that can s save them has its, yeah. its downside to it. So it, I think you're quite aware of that. Mm -hmm. And that has to be very careful because press sometimes picks up only on one side and says solutions are on their way. And so this is very careful for communicating and I'm not a great advocate of those uh, experiments even though they are interesting and they involve people and I see the positive sides to that. But yeah, note of yes. caution on, on the impact that might have on, on people's minds saying, well, not, not, not all is lost. Technological solutions always work. We just have to try harder. Thank you. Thank you for so many nice uh, visuals as well. It was really, uh, really interesting. Um, I wonder how the hazards are changing too, because uh, as you know, uh, Nevado de Ruiz um, erupted in the 1980s, I believe, and was a big disaster, uh, yeah. particularly because of the lahars generated from the glacier. So maybe the one bright side is this, is that you have less hazards because you have less glacier ice, right? You have a less volume to uh, produce lahars. Is that, uh, is that true or is that coming, coming up uh, in your your findings? Well, actually a, a, a challenge, uh, it's having a volcano so close to the glacier. So t because today, the ashes of uh, the Ruiz volcano, it's also affecting the carbon that Dirk was talking, as, uh, talking about. But I think, yes, maybe because, but because we have less, less of them, we have to take more uh, care. Uh, because w something that our country is not considering is the consequences of losing them. There is no adaptation or mitigation. What's going to happen when they, when they disappear? And I think that the focus and the conversation should start, should start being there if we know that they're going to they're gonna disappear, right? Uh, so other ways of, of getting water or uh, even the moving communities that live very, very close to rivers that are going to eventually be flooding the, those communities, nothing of this is happening. And this might happen in the next 10 years. So I think it's switching the conversation into how do we prepare to live in a country without glaciers from a landscape, landscape point of view and how devastating it will be to wake up and see that in your window you're not going to see the three mountains that you were usually seeing, but how do you prepare a new home for people that will need to evacuate because the floods will, will, will take over, right? That's, that's what I think, but I don't know if you want to complement from a more scientific point of view. Um, uh, 
I mentioned briefly the, the glacial lake outburst floods. Um, we didn't go into detail about the risks, but glacial re retreat uh, has a lot of risks associated with it. Uh, that, that is very, very true, that is very important. In some parts, when the glacier completely disappears, the glacier itself will not be uh, any risk anymore. But something that is recently being studied, at least in the, in the Andean region, is permafrost in the mountains, the destabilization of mountain slopes. And that is associated with glacier recession, but that is also in something that happens even after the glacier is gone. You have, you have mountain sites that are not stable. So if you have precipitation events stronger than you used to have, if we have a lot of rain where you used to have snow, uh, slopes can get affected and you can have avalanches, and, but there's very local information and, and studies on that, and most of them from Peru. So Peru is the, probably the best studied case in, in, in that sense. And as far as I know, volcanoes you have in Colombia and active volcanoes in, in Ecuador, I'm not sure. In Bolivia, you don't have active volcanoes, for example. So that is a phenomenon that is not for the whole region, but that's very local and, and specific, site-specific. And from a biodiversity point of view, uh, they will, we will lose a lot of endemic species, a lot. And so many that we don't have them catalogued and properly identified. So I think that's also a, a big loss. And another thing I think is really important, and we are only getting this um, in some conversation, is that as I say, when we lost the glacier, we have this so called super paramos. So that implies that you have more territory for taking water. So it could be like something that benefits like the government and some private companies. So what? When the glacier disappears, we are going to start to take in all that and how and put it livestock like we saw every time that we were go to glaciers. Even there are national parks. We have our six glaciers in national park where the deforestation is not allowed but for real when you saw there is livestock everywhere thank you so much everyone thank you dirk hoffman and cumbres blancas for these fantastic talks and thank you so much for attending and for all your questions so I just want to tell you about the rest of the program for today because the day has just started. There's a lot of exciting events happening here. So we're going to close off the Cryosphere Pavilion for just a short amount of time because we have a big ceremony coming off with the launch of the Cryosphere Pavilion. So that will start actually at 3 p.m. today, at 3 p.m. in room two. This is where the launch of the Cryosphere Pavilion will be taking place. So then we will actually be walking from the Cryosphere Pavilion to room two. So if you want to come with us to find room two, that will be easier. Um, and we have a lot of speakers that will be there for the launch of the Cryosphere Pavilion. We have the Minister of Science of Chile, the Minister for Development of Sweden, His Royal Highness, the Prince Albert II of Monaco, Vice Chair Cobaran of the IPCC, SCAR Spain, SCAR Chile, um, France, UK, the European Commission, and Bill Haar from Climate Analytics will be there in room two at 3 p.m. Then we will be back here at 4.30 for the ribbon cutting to officially open the pavilion, and there will be a small reception. So make sure you're here for that. Then, very important event, at 5.30, we're going to be talking about the Peruvian glaciers. And for that, we will have the, some scientists of the University of Zurich and CARE Peru. So make sure you do not miss that. And at 7 p.m. today, we have another great sad event on the future of glaciers at 1.52 degrees and above. And this will be uh, Paco Navarro, who is a glaciologist from the University uh, Politica of Madrid, Politecnico of Madrid. So thank you very much, and we'll see you later for the other events.